In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Today we celebrate the Feast of All Saints. And we do this for a couple of reasons. First of all, because throughout the year we often fail to properly honor the saints on their feast day. They get overlooked, passed over without so much as a second thought, and this is our occasion to make amends for that, but also because there's a whole host of saints in heaven that we do not know, and so we want to honor all of them. And so our Holy Mother, the Church, has instituted this feast for us to make that praise, that honor, that thanksgiving that is due to these saints in heaven who are members of the church, members of the mystical body of Christ. We teach our little children in catechism that there are three bodies to the church or three parts. The church triumphant, all the saints in heaven, the church suffering, all the souls in purgatory, and the church militant, us here on earth. And we are called the militant. Amos, do you know what militant means? No? You know what the military is? It's the army, the air force. I can't forget the air force because the hinks are here. But <laughs> The navy. There's more of the marines. You know, all those people who fight. We here on earth. Catholics here on earth. We are called the church militant because we're a part of God's army. We have to fight. And I know your parents tell you don't fight. <laughs> we're not supposed to fight with our brothers and sisters. We're supposed to fight against the devils. And we have been given the sacraments to strengthen us so that we can resist the temptations of the devils, the temptations of the world, the temptations of our own fallen nature. All the sacraments are there to strengthen us. And I'm afraid that so many children, not just little children, but some pretty old children, grown-ups, think that, oh, I received the sacrament, and now I can sit back and relax, I'm all good. And say, no, the sacraments weren't given to us so that we can sit back and relax. The sacraments were given to us so that we can employ them in our battle. It's to help us grow stronger, to give us something to fight with in this battle against the devils. And so these tools that God gives us, these sacraments, are meant to be employed for the battle against the devils. And this isn't something that's just our due because of original sin. I maintain that even before Adam and Eve had sinned, God had already told them their job is to fight a war against the devils. In the Garden of Paradise, where everything was perfect, all of creation obeyed Adam, God told Adam, increase, multiply, subdue the earth. Outside of the Garden of Paradise, the devils were running all over, and it was chaos. And Adam's job was to chase these devils back gradually. Not only Adam, but us in Adam, because all of his children, that was their duty, to go out into the world and fight this battle for God and to reclaim the earth to sanctify the earth, to bring it back to right order and obedience with God. That is our duty. That is the duty, not of the saints in heaven. The saints in heaven have merited their reward. They've retired from the military. Now they're collecting all their benefits. But we haven't. We are still here on earth, and it's our duty to fight. Now I can see the little children are not interested because they don't think that they can do anything to fight. And I want to tell you that you're wrong. And parents are wrong for trying to tell you that you're not important. 
You are important. And I would dare say you're more important than your parents. And why are you more important? Well, in today's gospel, our Lord laid out the Beatitudes, the eight Beatitudes. And if you haven't seen them in your catechism class, it's coming. The eight Beatitudes are there to tell us what we must do to become these saints in heaven. And if you'll just review over them, you'll see that children pretty much can fit into every one of those categories. <laughs> the children who have not yet sinned are going to be so much more pleasing in the eyes of God than adults who have sinned their whole lifetime, perhaps. Even if they've repented, they can't regain that innocence of the children. And we think that children are not important. We can shove them off in a corner and say, go play on the playground. And if you notice the playgrounds have fences around them. <laughs> not much different than the fence that we use to keep in what? Our cattle, our sheep, our goats. We keep the children all locked up inside the fence. That way they don't get hurt, right? It's for their own good. Isn't that what we say about the cattle, the sheep, the goats, whatever it is we're caging? We keep them in because it's what's best for them. It's what's good for them. But I wonder if you were to ask these animals if that's what they would like, if that's what they think is best for them, I'm pretty sure they would not agree. We want to run free. We don't want to be enclosed. We don't want to be caged. We want to be out there doing what the adults are doing. We want to be out there having fun doing what grown-ups do. And what are the grown-ups supposed to be doing? Yeah. Work. Yep, they're supposed to be working. And the children want to help work. That's what we need to do. But what is the grown-ups' work that they need to be doing? They need to be fighting the good fight. With St. Paul, they need to be driving back the devils, making this world a world dedicated to Christ the King, a world that is living in the presence of God, a world that thinks of God Every time you turn around to see the beauty and the majesty of all that God has created, that's the work that God has given them to do. And grown-ups get distracted. Oh, I've got all this paperwork to do. I've got this work to do in the computer. I've got this work over here and that work over there. And they forget their most important job is to love God. I'm really impressed with St. Paul. He says, it doesn't matter what you do. That's not important. You want to eat? Eat for the love of God. You want to fast? Fast for the love of God. You want to sleep? Sleep for the love of God. You want to work? Work for the love of God. You want to play? Play for the love of God. Whatever you do, just do it for the love of God. You sanctify everything in this manner. I tell you that children are very important. And I'm going to tell you about a great saint, St. Augustine. And he spent many years away from God, away from the church. And his mother was constantly praying for him, harassing him. You need to be baptized. You need to enter the church. And he kept putting it off and putting it off. But eventually, he did begin to believe. He was baptized. He was ordained a priest. He became a bishop, and he wrote some of the greatest works that we have. But one of those that is most common is called his Confessions, the Confessions of St. Augustine. And I've gone over this in classes with adults, but 
St. Augustine makes a comment that I see bristles the hair on the back of adults' heads. They just really can't grasp it. Because St. Augustine looks back at his whole life and he looks at infants. And he says something about infants that grown-ups really don't like to hear. But he's confessing of himself. He says, I don't really remember those things, but I see other children and I know that I was like other children. But the quote he says in his confessions, a child so little, but a sinner so great. And parents say, oh, children, children are not great sinners. And that's because parents and grown-ups have a distorted view of what sin is. You don't have to be big to sin grievously. You don't have to be strong to sin grievously. What, What is necessary for you to commit a mortal sin? It has to be something seriously wrong. You have to know it is seriously wrong, and you have to want to do it anyway. You don't care what God says. You don't care what your parents want. I'm going to do this because I want to do it. That's all that is necessary to commit a mortal sin. The sin is more in our will than it is in our body our ability to choose, and even the little baby can choose. St. Augustine says even the little baby nursing at its mother's breast can feel envy and hatred towards another little infant that he must share his toys with or another infant that his mother might take up and nurse because the other infant's Mother can't, maybe can't nurse it or is sick or some other problem, but if the mother would nurse someone else's baby, her own baby becomes envious, becomes jealous, becomes filled with rage. And adults tend to laugh at little children when they're filled with such rage and they throw their little tantrums. We laugh because we, oh, it's innocent. They can't hurt anything. They'll soon figure it out. But the evil is already there. What do you think, Veronica? You grasping what I have to say here? That evil is already there. And I say if these children are capable, as St. Augustine says, even though they're so little, they're capable of committing such great sin, I tell you the opposite is also true. Even though they are so little, they are capable of doing great things. And in heaven, there's not just grown-ups. In heaven, there are little children. In heaven, there are little babies. And they have accomplished in just a short while here on earth what it takes some people hundreds of years to do. 700 years to do, 800 years to do, and 900 years to do as in the Old Testament. These men lived a long time. And little infants can accomplish in just a short time of their life here on earth. Our Lord said to the little children, come to me. The apostles were trying to chase the mothers with their babies away. Take your babies, get out of the way. Jesus doesn't have time for you. And Jesus tells his apostles, you stop it. Bring me all the little children. These little children is what makes up the kingdom of heaven. You can't just put the little children in a little caged area and call it a playground and say, okay, we can forget about them. Oh, well, we won't forget about them. We'll pay somebody to stand out there and watch them. Make sure they don't get hurt. We need to realize that little children are in this war. And they need to learn how to know how to fight. 
Where are they going to learn? From other children? Who don't know any more than they know? Are they going to learn how to fight and be in this church militant by going to school and reading a textbook and listening to a lecture? I don't think so. Where do we learn? From those around us. Children learn by observing their parents. When they see their parents, when things aren't going right, lose their temper, what do they learn? Oh, when things don't go right, you can yell and scream and probably use a few foul words that you will get your mouth washed out if your parents hear you say it. But And what is that? Is that what they learn? You see, to be a grown-up, I have to act like a grown-up and I have to throw grown-up tantrums. See, rolling on the floor and yelling and screaming and holding your breath and pounding your fist, that doesn't work. That's not what grown-ups do. Grown-up temper tantrum is completely the opposite. Not really. But they do throw a tantrum. And children watch it. Okay, I get it now. Next time I'm angry and want to throw a temper tantrum, I have to do it the way the adults do. That must be the right way because that's the way my mommy and my daddy do it. I say if the children can learn these evil things from their parents and the adults in their life, they're supposed to be learning good things from the adults in their life. And when they see an adult, when things are not going well, to say, I must be patient. I must bear this little splinter of the cross for the love of God. I must take a deep breath and relax. Maybe I can help the poor souls in purgatory with my patience. This is the lesson they need to see. They have to see their parents in every situation. When you're cooking and you burn your finger or your hand, how do you react? You're teaching your children how they should react when similar things happen. Do you want to show them the patience that's going to get them into the kingdom of heaven? To teach them, yes, when things hurt, we can still be patient. We don't have to lose our head and start screaming and crying and fall apart. But like good soldiers of Christ, we can bear the pain. And when things are going well, do we think of God and thank God for the good things that have gone well? Do we teach our children to think of God? Whether it's raining or the sun is shining, to think of God, whether we're winning or losing, whether things are going well or they're not going well, whether we're struggling and having a hard time or whether things are going easy, do we think of God? And I admonish parents, adults, this is your job. You are modeling Christian behavior. You are supposed to be teaching your children how to be soldiers in this church militant if you're failing to teach them to be soldiers and the church militant here on earth, you're failing to prepare them for their retirement in heaven. You are setting them up for failure. You're setting them up for hell. And maybe parents don't care so much about themselves, but they generally do care about their children and they don't want their children to go to hell. And I say it's more important what you show, what you demonstrate, than what you tell your children.
telling is not teaching. It's useless to say, do as I say, not as I do. The parents need to change and do so that the children can see and follow. And sometimes I'm tempted to just throw my hands up for the parents and say, let's work for the children. Maybe we can save them in spite of their parents. Maybe we can teach the children to love God and they can go home and teach their parents how to love God. It's a long shot, but I don't see why it can't work. Because children, with the grace of God, are just as powerful as adults, and I would say perhaps even more powerful than adults. When the child speaks the truth, it sometimes hurts the adult. And if they can learn to speak the truth in a gentle manner, and perhaps win their parents for Christ, they have done a a very great deed in the kingdom of God. And so, adults, I admonish you once again to be careful of how you act, not only when you think your children are watching, but even when they're not watching all the time, because children are always watching. (laughs) And children, I encourage you to be good soldiers of Christ, even if you don't see any adults in your world doing it, even if none of your friends are doing it. You need to be a good soldier of Christ for the love of God and not be afraid I must sign myself with the sign of the cross properly, even if all my friends laugh at me. I must pray before I eat, not so that I can be an example and be proud and vain and show off to everyone else, tell them how much better that I, I am than they are, but I must pray because this is what God has told me to do, and I must be unafraid. I must be a soldier. And a soldier is ready to stand up and fight and even die for the kingdom. And little children have stood up and fought. Little children have died for the kingdom of heaven. And I say if they could do this in the early days of the church, I see no reason why we cannot do this today. And I dare say everything you're afraid of, my friends are going to laugh at me, my friends are going to run away, I won't have any friends anymore if I pray and if I uh, love God and if I behave and do good, they're going to call me a goody two-shoes. If your friends walk away from you for those reasons, they were never your friends to begin with. And if they are truly your friends, they will respect you and they will probably come to you and say, can you help me to love God the way you do? Can you show me how? They may not say it, but what they're implying is my parents and the adults in my life aren't showing me how to do this. It looks like you know how, can you help me to do it? And that is what a true Catholic does. That is what a true soldier of Christ does. And so as we honor all those saints in heaven, some who are ancient, very old, and some who are just perhaps a few days old, we honor them all. But the greatest honor that we can give to them is to follow them into the kingdom of heaven. Benedictio de omnipotentis, Fabris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti, descendit super vos, et maniat semper. Amen.